my goal tonight is to have you guys leave with some fun ideas for drills, but also just a good base idea of what the game is and what you guys can teach them at this age. Um, so the fundamentals, and I stress the fun part, I think when you guys start your seasons and thinking about this age, catching and throwing is number one. Right? That's, that's the big one. Right? If the kids can catch and throw, everything you're going to do, every drill, any practice you have is going to be 10 times easier. So for us, we always incorporate our stick work in the first 10 minutes of practice. Right? So any of our clinics, any practices we're running, we're always incorporating stick work in the beginning. Um, what I recommend, and this is a personal thing, you guys, you know, do what you want. I would never, at that age, do a line drill, right? So a line drill, you know, you line the guys up, you've got seven over there, seven here, and one runs and throws, he catches it, comes to the next guy, and it's back and forth, back and forth, right? The issue with that is a couple things. One, you're limiting their reps, right? So everything we do at our events is all high rep, right? So an easy way to take kind of what you're accomplishing there and incorporate into your practice high reps is to do part. So instead of line drills, right, we're most likely every single kid's gonna drop the ball or they're gonna miss it every time or they're gonna chase it. You end up just running around and wasting 10 minutes. Partner catch is a really good way to start your practices off. Um, what I would recommend is going about seven to eight yards. You can do this all the way down the field. Right? It really allows you to kind of walk up and down and coach the kids as they're going. It's easy for them to kind of chase the balls if they need to and come back to a spot. You don't need cones, right? Assuming you're out on a grass field, you don't need lines like this. Uh, but partner catch again is a really good way just to get high repetitions, right? So you set them up seven, eight yards. You have them work on their throwing motion. Yeah, you can switch hands. But what you notice here compared to us running a line drill is Every single rep is ours, right? So you're probably four or five times in the, the, the quality reps and the fundamentals that a kid would get in a line drill just by step starting your practice like this. Right? That's one of the reasons that we've kind of incorporated those. We do this at the college level too. And again, it just increases the reps. I think the more they have with these, the more comfortable they get with it, and the quicker they're gonna figure it out. Right, so that's number one. In terms of catching, right, simple ways that you can take a drill like this every practice or every other practice and start to make it fun. Um, I always equate with our little guys catching just like an egg toss or a water balloon toss. Right? It's just something you give them a visual, they go to that school days, things like that. You can start to be like, oh, okay, if I'm going to catch a water balloon, I'm not going to swat at it. i got to have soft hands. Right? So any way you can equate it to fun, real world stuff like that, I think the kids just get it quicker. Right, if you go out and tell them, hey, have soft hands, or what the heck are you talking about? Like, my, my kindergarten son would have no idea what I was talking about, but if I said catch an egg, they're like, oh, okay, like, I gotta have soft hands. All right, so one drill that we do, uh, we'll do an egg toss competition, we call it. You can start them really close, and then what you do is, every time a group catches it, you back up two steps. All right, and that's just a good way to end your partner catch every day. Once a group drops it, they sit down, and you just keep going until you have a winner, right? So it kind of gets them on a high early. They're excited about the drills they're doing. Somebody wins, which is always exciting. And it's a good way to kind of build in some competition. Right? I think that any way you can do that, and kind of transform these drills into fun competitions for the kids, they're going to love. Right? And again, in the end, it's all about them having fun, trying to keep their focus, keep the energy up. Um, so that's one of my biggest recommendations for stick work is starting your practices like this. I think that's a huge help. Uh, in terms of stick work and also shooting, and I think this goes overall in terms of our sport in general, some of the most success I've had with players of all ages in terms of coaching them and really honing their fundamentals has been connecting what we do to other sports. All right, so a perfect example, our throwing motion is very similar to a pitcher in baseball. It's very similar to a quarterback on the football field. It's also shooting wise, very similar to a golfer in terms of the way they finish their rotation. Right, so if you, if you play any of those sports, if you've ever done any of those things, sometimes you go out with a third grader and you say, hey, who's your favorite quarterback? You know, and he tells you, you say, okay, if he's throwing the ball 40 yards downfield, he's probably not gonna throw it like this. Right, he's gonna extend his arms, he's gonna be nice and loose, he's gonna step, and he's gonna throw to his target and the, and the light goes on, and the next time he takes a stick, he looks like this, 
instead of right here like this, which you see a lot at that age. Right, so using that connection, I think, for passing, for shooting, is just a really good way to give the kids a visual. I think the more you can do that, the more they connect with it right away, especially early in the season when you start. It's just a good way to kind of create that. So one thing that you'll see with younger players is a lot of coaches will advise them to put their top hand high. Right? The reason being, with your hand a lot higher, it's a little easier to kind of see the ball and catch it. My only issue with that, and this is a personal preference, is that the older you get, you're told the complete opposite. So you would never in a lacrosse game want to catch a ball like this. It's the opposite. You pretty much make a living here. Right, so I recommend for youth players, teach them to have their top hand a little higher. I don't recommend sliding your hand all the way to the top, just because I think it's a bad habit, and then you're gonna end up having to break it you know, the next year with your new team. Uh, but bottom hand's always on the bottom. Top hand is about halfway to three quarters up the stick. And again, that's really where you catch and throw. Um, anytime you're shooting, that top hand will come down to about here. Good question. Another thing that you can stress with the kids is alligator arms. Um, that's another one that connects with them a lot. So as I said earlier, kind of thinking about a quarterback. Anytime we see youth players and they're shooting or passing like this, right? So their arms are in. You can call it dinosaur arms, alligator arms, whatever you want. But as soon as they hear that, they know what you're talking about. And you just tell them, hey, you don't want alligator arms. We can't play our game in here. We have no range of motion. Right? You want to make sure that you extend your hands nice and loose, and that allows you to follow through and just have a good range of motion when you're throwing your passes. Two players, for most players, these guys might have some form of tape. Um, I think tape on your butt end is a good idea, one to hold it on, but it's also a good idea just to get them feeling kind of that bottom of the stick. The other one is, to your question, is putting a piece of tape about halfway up the stick. Right, so you want to tell them, hey, you don't want to go higher than that, but that's a good place where you can have your hand in the cradle. It's a good place to catch, something like that. And that's something you can easily take off too, you know, as you work your way out. It's not on there permanently, but uh, definitely something that helps you play. Shooting, ground balls, again, is something that I would highly recommend to touch on as much as possible. Why? One, they're a huge part of our game. Two, where's the ball going to be 90% of the time at your level, on the ground? Right? It's one of the most common things you see at the youth level in general, but certainly at K through fourth, right? The ball's on the ground all the time. So the better your team is at ground balls, the more successful you're gonna be and the more time it'll be in their sticks. Alright, so a couple quick base things. One of the things that we tell all of our young guys, I think it's funny, but what I found is at least the past two years telling guys that work through our programs, they always remember it because it sounds funny. Ground balls, you've got to get low. All right, so anytime you're picking up a ground ball, we tell all of our guys, you have two butts. And again, I know that sounds silly, we do it on purpose, but you have the butt end of your stick, and you have yours, all right? As soon as we say that, we tell them get both down low. All of a sudden, they all go like this, all right? If you just tell them get your butt end low, like a lot of coaches do, the issue is a lot of guys will do this, all right? They just bend at the waist, they don't get their knees down. So when they're going up to a ground ball, they're doing this, and they're still kind of shoveling into the ball. Right? If they get both down low, it helps them get parallel to the ground, bring that ball right up to their face. Right? So something you can just write down to remind your kids, it's just a fun way to get them good on ground balls, get both butts low, and you can tell them all the time, remind them, I guarantee you they'll remember. Right? Really helps them just do a good job of getting down low. One of my favorites, pretty simple drill that we do. Okay, the first one is called traffic GBs. All right, so traffic ground balls is really designed, and you can do this with two guys, you can also do it with one, um, but it's really designed to get players used to picking up a ground ball with a stick on it, right? So in traffic, uh, to really, you know, kids think it's fun, it's non-contact, they're just running through the sticks, there's no checks here. All right, but as you'll see here, go ahead, as soon as he comes through, they kind of just lift their sticks up, all right, and work their way through. All right, you coaches can be the ones with your stick over the ball. That's the way we do it with our young guys. You have all the balls at your feet, put a new ball out, 
they scoop through. All right, another good thing you can do with this is, you know, day one you can do it this way, and then day three you do the same drill, but after they pick up the ball, you have them shoot. All right, so it goes from a ground ball into a shot. It's just a simple segue that you can do that. You see Brandon here, get nice and low. Again, a couple different things that you can do other than shooting. You can pick that ball up, you can have them throw it back to you. It's a really simple way to have it go from the ground to a pass. It doesn't seem like you're doing a ton, but they're working those fundamentals without really thinking about it. Okay, that's kind of the key with all this stuff is make little tweaks to the drills just to help them start to build that stuff. Old school, like the game Hungry Hippos, most of the kids will have no idea what you're talking about. They've never actually played Hungry Hippos, uh, but Sad. they'll all figure it out quickly. Right, so what, this is a small version, obviously. You can make this box as big as you want. What we'll do is we'll set up cones. Right, each one's about 10 15 yards apart. Put even groups on each cone. And then you put 20 to 30 balls in the middle. Right, so on the whistle, one guy from each group goes in, picks up a ball, comes right back to his team, and next guy goes. Right, you go until all the balls are picked up. At the end, you stop, you have each team count, okay, and whoever has the most balls wins. Again, the key here is stressing the fundamentals. So one of our things is, if you break the ball, right, so you'll see a lot of your players come up to a ground ball, stop, and the easiest way for them, they think, to pick up the ground ball, is to go like this and break the back of their stick. The issue is, in order to do that, I have to stop my feet. Right, so I have to run up, stop, break, and then go. In our game, it's the opposite. You want to pick up a ball cleanly and run to open space. You don't ever want to stop the feet. Right, so if they break the ball, you can either knock it out or make them drop it and make them go again. Right, so they have to do it in good form, but again, it's a really good way to get them rep high reps with ground balls, and it's just a fun competition. Right? You guys don't have to ask me why you want to go on. All right. Ready? <laughs> no checks. All right, you can work back and forth as fast as you can. There you go. All right, again, this is just the tight box version. But you can do this as big as you want. on the game, uh, if you have multi coat balls, so what we'll do is, is the coaches will be on the edge, and every once in a while we'll throw all white. We'll throw yellow balls in there, call money balls, they're worth three. And what you end up seeing is all the kids are kind of like going slow away from the money ball. Uh, but again, it's just a good way to kind of add a fun element to drills maybe that you've been doing for a while. It's a good way to mix it up. We run another one called tic-tac-toe. Um, so the best way to picture this is, it's tic-tac-toe with the cross ball. Right, so you set up two groups, you actually set up in cones a tic-tac-toe course, right, as small or as big as you want, and you have two teams. Each team has to pick up a ground ball and go drop it in a square, and they're playing to get three in a row. Right, so it's a competitive game. The strategies with the kindergartners is absolutely hilarious. It's like our favorite game to do with them because there's literally no strategy. Um, but as they get older, it's definitely a competitive game. It's a lot of fun to watch them do it. And again, it's a way to play tic-tac-toe, but what are they working on? Ground balls with good form, right? No raking, they got to run, and they're also, without, without even thinking about it, they're trying to get to the square as quickly as they can so they don't stop their feet. They don't run up to the ball and stop. They want to pick it up and get to the square as quickly as they can. So all you're doing is reinforcing ground balls, pick it up and go. Your feet moving without even saying it. Right, so the more you can kind of hide this stuff in your drills, it's almost like the less coaching you need to do, but they're also reinforcing all those good habits. Like in terms of clinic breakdown, we run all of our sessions for 60 minutes. The reason being, and I know practice is a little different, you have more to do. I think drills like these, 10 minutes is usually your cap. Right now, if you have a lot of kids and you need to run it longer, that's fine. You can obviously run this in multiple groups. You know, if you have a couple coaches. Um, but I think with all of our drills at this age group, I think 10 minutes to 12 minutes is usually where you lose for focus. 
right? They're ready to go to the next thing. They're asking for water. So we usually try to keep practice flowing as much as we can. So they never hit that point of, okay, I'm bored, or what's the next drill? Right, it kind of just keeps them focused. So that helps a lot. So typically about 10 to 12 minutes. So going back to what I said in the beginning, the ball's gonna be on the ground 90% of the time in your practices when you're playing games. And what do you see the most? It's as soon as the ball goes on the ground, one guy runs up and stops, every single player on the field runs to the same spot, and you have nine people around one ball all gone like this. All right, so, so that question, anytime that happens in your practice, and we do this at all of our levels, blow your whistle and just yell, freeze. Stop them and make them all stay put. And then you can walk up and say, okay, how many of you are here? How many of you need to be here? Probably two. Right? This, that's the, the biggest thing for youth guys is learning to pick up balls. The other one, and it's a great thing to teach in that moment, is two things that you can do in our game. One in particular that you want to teach early is use your feet. So that's kind of your soccer connection. You can't pick up the ball with your hand. But if you can't pick it up with your stick, you can boost that ball out of space, out of that pile, and then go pick it up. That's also something you can do in your drills. All right, so you can start your drills, you can have your players start over a ball, kick it out, and then go get it. That's another good one. So we call this sumo ground balls. Uh, what you do is you go back to back, and you can run this all the way in the field in groups of two. So it's a high rep drill, you can have your whole team doing it once, but all over the field. So you get guys back to back, put the ball right underneath you, and then on the whistle, everybody has to try to box out and get the ball. But you notice there, it just happened, most likely in this position, especially with a pole, but even with a short stick, you don't want guys doing this, very unrealistic. Make them kick it out first. So it's a good way to practice kind of being in a pile, boxing out, which is like what? Basketball. Right? So if anyone plays basketball, good way to connect to that. But working on that box out and then kicking that ball out and then going again. That, that's another good one. Again, that's a high rep drill you can do with your whole team at once. Really good way. Even if you're by yourself coaching, you can still do that with your whole group. I think this is the one area where you can really connect it to other sports. Um, I use golf a ton. I think the way golfers finish their swings, what you'll notice with a lot of your players is that when they shoot, they probably rotate about 30-40% of the way. Right, so they're here, they got their arms set, and they shoot. Right, if I were a golfer, that ball would have gone like 20 yards. Right, if I want to drive the ball 200 yards, I need to finish my swing. All right, and that's kind of what you can equate it to. So you start working with your guys on finishing your rotation. In our game, most of your power is generated from your core, from your, from your hips, right, and from your feet, really. All right, your arms are only about 20% of it. Right, so we try to teach our guys to understand I always try to talk about like a video game, right? And they all light up, like what the heck are you talking about? Right, it's talk about powering up in a video game. The power starts in your feet, loads all the way up through your hips, your torso, your chest, your shoulders, literally until you get to the ball on your stick. And that's your full power meter, right? When you get to that point, that's where you're gonna be shooting hard, that's where you're gonna be scoring goals. All right, so it's getting yourself set up here and kind of seeing your players with that full setup and then that one drill that I love to do, one of the biggest issues that I think you have at youth practices, depending on your fields, is what field you're on, no backup nets, you miss the cage 500 times, which means you spend an hour ball running. All right, so how can you set your drills up, especially for shooting, so you don't have to chase a lot of balls, but you can get quality reps. Uh, so we call this angry scoring. What we do is, 
wherever, and you can do this on multiple goals, but we put a cone out about three yards from the cage. This is not designed for accuracy. This is purely designed for fundamental shooting drill. So we'll have the kids come up with a ball on their stick. We set them up like I showed you. They have to freeze before they go, right? So it gives you the ability, it gives you the ability as the coach to say, okay, your, arm, your arms are here. You gotta pull them up and away, right? Maybe, you're, maybe their feet are facing the wrong way, right? Little things like that. It allows you to take a look at their form and correct it before they shoot. All right, when you say go, you tell them to get as mad as possible at the ball, as angry as they can. I literally said to a kid this winter in our session with the Springboard guys, I said, like, somebody stole your dog. He was like, okay. And he shot the ball really hard. Like, that's what you need, that's fine. But whatever it is, get angry at the ball, and he's going to shoot as hard as he can, dead center on the goal. Go ahead. Good. So good rotation on his hips, good follow through. Now again, you do this drill 10 yards away, chances of you losing your balls goes up about 80%. <laughs> if you do it at three yards, you can get a ton of reps, get your kids really with working on good shooting for them, and it's a good way again to kind of get them used to that feeling of what it's like to finish a shot and really win team. Something that you can progress to is kind of letting your letting your players start to understand a little bit where they are on the field and how to kind of gauge that. Right? So the further out you are, the more stretched you are. Right? So the more you want a full shot because you need your full power. Right? As you work your way in, two things happen and you can use the women's arcs here that are actually great for coaching. But if you catch a ball here, two things are going to happen. One, this is the highest traffic area on the field. So if I throw this ball, and like most second graders, he winds up, almost a guarantee that there's a guy three yards to him. That's what I'm gonna do that. All right, if he catches this ball in tight, right by his ear, we call these quick sticks. You notice he doesn't cradle, he sticks right by his ear, and that gives him the ability to hide it, and also get the ball out pretty quickly. Right, so the closer you get to the cage, the more of the red zone you're in, the more you want to bring that stick into your shoulders. The further away, or when you're passing, you want to start to get out. <clears throat> Something else you can do to help with that, and again, thinking about where you can have your biggest issues, one is just catching and throwing, right? So how do you eliminate that? You throw the balls. Right, so if you want to get shooting reps right here, set your line up and have the players catch and shoot in tight, but you're tossing the balls. Right, it gives you control of the reps instead of having the players throw it where one out of five they catch or is catchable. Right, so again, a little tweak you can make. You're sitting here with a bucket, there's a line, he steps in, a little quick stick, next guy goes. Right, and it's just a good way to guarantee reps. Right, I think one of the biggest issues that you have at the youth level is guaranteeing quality reps. Right, so in that hour and a half, how do I make sure that my kids are actually getting reps where they're getting better? That's a really good way to do it. We do a ton of work with ball toss. Right, it just gives the coaches the control. You guys have the ability to put the ball right where you want it. Right? And then eventually, when you're comfortable with it, you can work up to where the kids are throwing it. But you certainly don't need to start with that. Right? Anyway, I think you can kind of, again, set those drills up to where the reps are really good. It's gonna build their confidence and it's making the most of the time that you guys have. I think at the youth level, if you can get your players to shoot with good form, that is all that matters. If they're shooting with good form and they hit that six by six gauge, you win. You guys <laughs> That's hard enough, right? The other thing is, and one of the issues that we see with making players shoot bouncers, is a lot of times when players shoot bouncers at that age, they'll really drive their top hand 
into the ground like this. Right? And the issue that you run into is that just reinforces bad habits. So it may seem easier at times to tell them that, but I think shooting the ball hard and just hitting that goal is hard enough. Right? So setting them up to just shoot with good form and really get used to being out here and putting that ball anywhere, right, is something that's going to be a lot easier. So everybody's a little different with how they build their practices out. You know, I always feel like in terms of timing, you think about an hour to an hour and a half, you know, you've got your stretch period and maybe a lap with a ball on your stick, you know, which is about 10 minutes. You've got stick work, which that partner catch will be about 12 to 15. Maybe your first week or two, it's a little longer, right? You've got your skill section, right? So some of the drills we just talked about, maybe ground balls one day, shooting the next day, and you just mix those drills up each day you're out there with them, maybe once or twice a week, all right? And then the last segment is where we put a lot of emphasis with our young guys, and that's the competition portion. I think the competition portion of practice that you're kind of building in with your skill drills anyway, but it's something that they look forward to every practice that kind of gets them through the first 30 or 40 minutes, right? They'll always be asking, are we doing sharks and minnows? Are we doing Thunderdome? Are we gonna do relay races today? And it just, you know that their minds are going towards that and it just kind of gets them to that part of practice and keeps them focused. So the three drills, that I'll tell you guys about sharks and minnows. Coaches that have been around probably know that game. A lot of people are nodding their heads. That's probably the easiest one, right? You set the kids up on the sideline. The coaches are the sharks, and they have to make it across the other side of the field with the ball in their stick, right? So they got to work on cradling. They got to work on dodging you. And then if you trust your kids, depends on who you have. Once they're out, you can make them sharks. Right? I would hesitate on that early just because the kids go a little crazy. Um, but if you have three coaches, it's really easy to do. It's a little bit of a workout, uh, but it's a lot of fun for the kids. They just love the chance to do that. Uh, another one that's kind of a twist on Sharks and Minnows that we run, we call Thunderdome. Uh, so what we do is you take a space like the rectangle that you guys are standing in right now. Right, so this white line here to the midline, you put your whole team in the box that you set up. They can't leave the box. You guys are the gladiators, and the last person in that box with a ball on their stick wins. So instead of running across and just trying to make it, they actually have to stay in that space. And you can make that as fun as you want, right? It's just one of those games where the kids hear Thunderdome, they hear gladiators, they go nuts, and it's a lot of fun, right? But again, it's a great drill where they're reinforcing, moving, dribbling with the ball on their stick. Right? The more you can get them running full speed, running around different players, weaving, going all over the place without dropping this ball, the more successful they're gonna be. And I can tell you the last thing in the Thunderdome they're thinking about is the fact that they're working on cradle. All they're thinking about is getting the heck away from you. But that's good, right? That's what you want, it's by design. So that's, that's another good one that you can do at the end of practice. Um, the other two that I'll use these guys for in a sec are just traditional relays, right? So that's the first one. Uh, you can vary these any way you want. You can set these up full field, half field, but relay races are a go-to for, for all youth sports, but youth lacrosse at this age, I think relays are great, right? You have them form team names, you get the kids going crazy, and you set it up however you want. Uh, relay race are also a good way to work on dodging, right? So they gotta pick up the ball, dodge the coach, touch the cone, and come back, right? Little things like that where they're working on those skills, but it's a race at the end of practice. They're really amped up about it, they're excited about it, and it's a good, good way to get them working on those skills. Uh, another one, and this is one of our favorite drills that we run we call fatigue shooting. The fatigue part comes from doing it with the older guys, not necessarily the little guys, uh, but this is a drill that we, we love because it's competitive, incorporates a lot of shooting. So what the drill is, and we do this usually with two to three goals. So if you have two cages, you can bring them down and have them on each side. 
And we usually have four groups at once. So you can do this with your whole team. In terms of distance, you go as far out as you want. But the drill, this is just the shortened version. All right, these guys are gonna start with a ground ball at each cone. All right, so coaches will roll the balls out. On the whistle, the first guy up is gonna pick it up, run all the way to goal line, come back to his shooting cone, just pretend it's hammering. Yeah, come back to his shooting cone that you set up and shoot. All right, if they score, it's a point. All right, next group goes. You can play to 21. You can get them as tired as you want with this drill. Um, but it's a competitive drill. The guys are all amped up to keep score. And it's something that the kids just get really psyched up about. We do this with our K guys all the way up to our eighth graders. Because it's also a high level skill drill and a conditioner for the older guys too. Right, so just a good way again to building, conditioning, get them used to running a little bit, which obviously our game is a lot of and also to work on ground balls, cradling, and shooting. Right? We call that fatigue shooting. Shooting drills are probably the easiest thing to set up in a ton of different ways to where you can just give a kid a ball and have him run somewhere and shoot. Right? So the biggest thing I think for, for kids that age is making sure that they're getting used to shooting in the right spots. Right? So we love to coach our guys to get them to understand the middle of the field and our game is the best place to shoot, right? So in terms of your momentum, you always want to try to set your drills up to where if you're shooting on the run, you're either coming down the alley towards the goal or you're coming this way, sweeping towards the goal, right? So high rep-wise, you can set up cones. We call this over the cone, right? Really simple, but you have a line and the kids have to run over the top of the cone first and then before they shoot, they have to square their hips up and follow through, right? So that's something you can start your practice with. Again, the only reason I don't harp on those is because chances of them hitting the cage are slim, and it ends up being a 40-minute you know, ball. Uh, but anytime you want to do shooting drills you know, that aren't competitive or the ones that we showed you, yeah, I think the more you can get their feet moving and just used to running with the ball on their stick, the more realistic it's going to be. We love to start our youth clinics. We'll get all the kids lined up when they're done stretching, ball on their stick, and then I'll have a whistle. And what we do is we have them all start here in the same hand. Every time you blow your whistle, you have to switch. And the whistles get faster and faster and faster and faster, right? You kind of ramp it up as much as you can. That's a good way to start every practice, right? Simple to that question. One of the things that kids struggle with the most, and I'm like my own five-year-old is starting K lacrosse this year, and he's a lefty, and anytime I tell him to go righty, he's like, <laughs> he's great with his left, but anytime I tell him to go right, he can't do this. Like I'm, just, I'm trying to get him to understand. So in our in those in those drills, it just gets the kids used to sliding their bottom hand up and switching their top hand down. Right. So another little thing in our game that. You know, is really important, and the sooner they can figure out how to switch those hands comfortably, the easier it is to run away from guys and go to school with guys and do all those things. So I think simple whistle drills like that are the best way. Um, the other way is in those relay races, you don't even have to dodge, but you can make them switch. Them. That's another thing that we'll do. So instead of split dodging, we'll just say you got to run up and immediately just switch hands. So they're not looking at the feet, they're really focused on that. I think that helps a lot too. But I think the majority of your kids, you'll see running with the ball, not going like this, mm -hmm. right? So they kind of put it out, they hold it. So two things that I would say, one is in that same drill, another thing you can do is maybe the next practice, instead of having them switch hands, on the whistle, keep it in your strong hand and have them just work on that cradling motion, right? So it's just a good way to kind of get them used to it. The other one is, is then reinforcing in all the drills we talked about, right? So you can stop it and say, okay, no one's cradling. Everybody's just running with their stick out. Um, and if you're comfortable with it, you know, if the kids are in pads, like, you know, we'll, every once in a while, if we see a kid with one hand, we'll just go up and tap the stick and be like, listen, you, have, you, have, you don't have a strong stick right now. 
if you add that second hand, it's a lot harder to get that ball out. Yeah, so the more you can just reinforce that in the drills, I think the better, because the kids are likely just to do this. Yeah, definitely one of the, the things we see, we see at a young age. Yeah. This is a drill that we do with guys youngest, we do with our college guys. It's called Protect the Cone. This is one of my favorite drills defensively that we do, that I've ever done, um, and it's something that I think reinforces all defensive fundamentals. So what you do is take their sticks away, also fun because the kids drop their sticks. Uh, what you do is back up a little bit faster. So you have one player on defense, you have another one on offense, all you have to get them the All right, what, as, in terms of coaching points, the defensive player is treating this just like he would defensively where he wants to see the ball at all times. Right, what you'll see the first time you do this drill with that ease, you're going to go like this. Right, just stand over the ball. So force them to come out like they're actually playing defense. Right, the second piece is just splitting the field. Right, so they're all going to come out straight out like this. You want to stop them on the first rep, have them flip their hips, and split the field. Right, it's just like you know, when you're playing defense, you want to keep a guy going one direction. You don't want to let him just dance all over the place. Right, so you have to split the field. The drill itself, the offensive player gets three moves to touch that ball. And this is where you guys come in, you have to officiate a little bit. This is not a football drill. So the first <laughs> rep, you're gonna split the ball, and it could be a big kid versus a little kid, and he's gonna just run them over. Hey, tell them before the drill, this is not a bulldog drill, it's not a football drill, it's not a gladiator drill. Right, this is really designed for the defender. The offensive player is supposed to act like he has a stick in his hand. So he's gonna try to shake me up and throw three different moves. The other piece of this that helps with that is that the offensive player gets 360 degrees. Right, so flip the beat. So when you say go, I don't have to go right away. I can move a little bit. Right, let's say I throw a move here, he does a good job and drives me out. Not that good. And drives me out. Now I have to reset. And every time I'm moving, what's he doing? He's readjusting. On defense, what do we do the entire defensive possession? Readjust non-stop. You're constantly flipping your hips, your head's on a swivel, you're looking around, you want to make sure that you're in the right position to cover your guy and also help out inside. So it helps you kind of get in that mindset and reestablish. Um, but one last thing, it's just a really, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a mess to start, but it's still a really fun way to get them in a breakdown position and just working on flipping their hips. You can do that drill three times a week, and I guarantee it'll work. It is, it's just a lot. Of and then I would say too, in terms of defense, I, I don't, I know most of the stuff we're talking about fundamentally is more skill offensive wise. But I think in terms of that level, one thing that I've always found is the, the IQ, so the understanding of what's going to happen in the game defensively, is a lot harder at that age. So if you can just get them used to just shadowing a guy like that, I think that'll be a big success, right? Because if you try teaching slide principles and one-on-one -on -one defense and two-on-twos, which we see sometimes at a young age, I mean, their, their heads are ready to explode. Like, what on earth are you talking about, right? And that's why I think, again, this stuff, the more they get comfortable with the fundamentals, when they get to the point with their coaches, where they're at that age, maybe fifth grade, that kind of thing, now they can actually focus on that because they're not frustrated because they can't catch ball. They can really, really focus on the IQ development piece, which at that point, they have plenty of time. They don't need to be great at that stuff in the second. The one thing you don't want to do with your goalies is just throw them in the cage and let your kids pepper them. That is not going to help. Right? What you want to do with your goalies, especially especially if it's a kid that is really excited about it and you think might want to play it the whole season, is just build their confidence and understanding of the position. One thing that I would recommend is don't just warm them up. Right? They're not going to know how to hold their stick. They're not going to know where to put it on saves. What you want to do with them is all muscle memory work. Right, so ball toss is something you see collegiate players do. You do this your whole career as a goalie. It doesn't involve them getting shelled with shots. 
But what you're doing is just reinforcing a couple key goalie elements. He's stepping to the ball. Right? So that's the number one, right? At that age, they say they want to play goalie. As soon as the shot comes, what happens? They don't move at all. <laughs> Nothing moves. Right? And if they try to make a save, it's all what's in their hands and their body doesn't move. Right? The hardest thing to get the players to do is to actually step to the ball. Right? The more they step to the ball, the more they're going to be in front of a shot. Let's go uh, stick to the so it's not first, ready? So it's just stepping here. Right? So it's just getting it. You do this with your gloves on, and you tell them, all right, we're going to go all stick side high. You know, I'm a righty. We're going to go all stick side high. And it's just getting them used to stepping to the ball and just driving their top hand on the stick to the ball. Right? Same thing. You do that at each position. So hips, do it down low. Right, so it's just stepping, helping them turn their hand on low shots, and it's just getting used to just getting to the ball at different spots. Right, again, that's not throwing them in the cage and shooting at them. It's just them getting used to stepping and really just feeling that motion of getting to a ball. Right, then you give them their stick. You can do the same thing with a stick, but with a toss. Right, so same exact thing now. You're not shooting on them yet, but do it there. So sticks out high. Right, have them just punch their hands, have them get to different spots. Right, you don't have to overcoach a goalie that I, that age. I think if they're able to take a shot, right, so get used to getting hit, um, but they're comfortable attacking the ball, they'll be fine. Definitely not a position you need to overcoach them. Once they hit that like third, fourth, and even later, like fifth, sixth grade, that's when they'll start doing like, positional goalie. Really good. I would because they probably have no idea how to use a goalie stick yet, <laughs> um, and it's a little heavier, but a lot of times what you'll see is as goalies get older, they do a ton of stuff with short sticks, right? Because that giant goalie stick, it's a lot easier to have a bad habit or be slower, but you have that giant stick. It looks like you got there when you should, but you really didn't. If you can get there with a short stick, right, and a smaller head, you're probably doing things the right way in terms of where you are. So, definitely can do those drills with a normal stick, just give it to them and make them work on that, and then maybe give them a little stick.